All right, welcome everybody. For those of you who are joining us live tonight, welcome. For those of you who are joining us in the future, we're happy that you came back to view this. Um, tonight I have with me Kate Vogel and John Littleton. Um, they are here to talk about vitriography as part of a new exhibition that we have at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. Um, welcome John and Kate, we're so excited to have you all here tonight. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, we're excited to talk about vitriographs and just what you're doing at your museum. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. And oh, we got to get out of that. This is the fun part about Zoom, you know, you always run into fun things. So we have a photo of two people on the left. <laughs> and um, you might not believe it, but they're actually sitting here in front of us today. So John and Kate, before we get into talking about Harvey Littleton, um, who John is your father, um, I just wanted for you all to have a chance to talk about yourselves a little bit, how you got into glass, because both John and Kate are um, wonderful glass artists in their own right. Uh, you might re remember or recognize the piece on the right if you've been to the Fort Wayne Museum of Art. It's been on display in our atrium for a very long time and just recently retired. Um, so John and Kate, take it away if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Okay, um, I grew up with glass. My father had grown up with glass in Corning, New York. His father, my grandfather, was a physicist at Corning Glassworks. He was in research and development. And dad talked about, oh, some of their dinner conversations would be, the properties of glass or um, how jello would break in a way that was like glass. So when I was five years old, dad had always wanted to be able to teach glass in the university art department. But that was the first year that he could. And so John grew up watching his dad blow glass and watching the other students blow glass. And so when we met at UW-Madison, John and I met in the glass department at Madison. His dad had already taken a sabbatical, but I should actually probably back up. John didn't say is his father is considered the father of the studio glass movement because he was really that person who had that passion and drive. Glass was really in the hands of industry pre-John's father. There was a few limited number of people who worked with glass in their own but studio. But they didn't teach it, and it wasn't really available in art departments. Or for artists to work with as an artistic material. And so Harvey's contribution really was that he brought glass to the forefront by making it available to artists and by teaching it in the university and spreading that information all over. And in the beginning, industry hadn't really shared how you do it all. Dad had been kicked out of a lot of the glass studios in Italy. in Italy, in Murano. <laughs> and they were starting from scratch, which I think my father really loved that they didn't have this long tradition of what you had to do. It was open to, what do you wanna do? How do you use this amazing material and its properties? Mm -hmm. And so he was very into experimenting, which really plays into how he ended up doing vitriography because that experimenting was really at the core of what Harvey really loved. Um, and I think that that also played off on John and I. So we actually started working together in his father's studio in this Spruce Pine. This photo is in dad's studio in Spruce Pine. And in the background, oh, there are some vitriographs. They're tiny, so Very it's probably cool. hard to yeah, identify. I never them. noticed those before. But that's what you're seeing. That's kind of a long look through his studio to the gallery. And those are vitriographs hanging on the wall there, which is always fun. Um, so we... I was doing photography. Kate had been in printmaking and I'd had printmaking in, in high school. But in college, I focused on photography. I loved the glass students and the glass classes. And I did independent study with photography and glass. And that's where I met Kate. Yep. So we met at UW-Madison. And then when we came down to North Carolina, um, John's dad gave us time in the studio to work. And I had been doing glass blowing at Madison for maybe like a year and a half, two years. 
um, before we came, went to North Carolina. So we worked in John's father's studio for about a year before we moved to Bakersville where we currently live and set up our own studio. And our work has been since, I don't know, maybe three months into working in John's studio, John's dad's studio, everything we've done since then pretty much has been collaborative. So we've collaborated over 42 years. And it was one of those things that people go, well, how does that, you know, how does that work to collaborate? Well, what happens is, is you start getting involved in the process. It's you glass blowing often takes two people to do, or mm -hmm. it's a lot easier anyway. Yeah. And rather than having one person being in charge and the other person just kind of like bringing parts, or the whole team. Or, yeah, yeah, it was much easier for us to have us both sort of like giving input on it. Like, oh, what do you think if we did this? What will happen if we try that? How can that? we make this better next time? Let's try this. And so that collaborative process came through us blowing glass together. And then it's just expanded into all of our work. And one of us might have an idea in the beginning, but in the end, it becomes both of our work because as we start thinking about how do you execute it, what would this look like in three dimensions? What's the process? What if we change this a little bit? By the time you get far enough down the line that the piece is completed, it's not really my work or John's work. It's our work. No. And I imagine working together for so long too, it's really nice because glass is such a, it's a dance kind of, you have to do a lot of different things at the same time, like you mentioned. So having somebody who you've worked with for over 40 years, you can kind of read each other's minds, I would think a little bit where if you work with a new team every time, which a lot of glass artists have to do, it might not be as intuitive. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's also well, awesome. I, so most glass people work in a series and it gets better as you go. So it's learning those steps, learning that all the moves that you have to make to make it happen. And I think that's that's a big part of it. He's building on it. If your your team has input as you're going on, it gets better. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, on the right here, I just want to point out a couple pieces from John and Kate's studio. So this is kind of an older work. This is from 1986 called Bagged Bags. And you all are kind of well known for these pieces of these little bags inside one another. And also um, these cast glass pieces of, of hands that are very, very realistic holding these gems. So I just wanted to ask you all real quick, um, where do these ideas kind of spur from, or, or at least in these older works, um, what were you kind of thinking about when you are making these, and then we'll talk a little bit about where you're headed in your current body of work. So with the bags, we actually started by making soft forms because when we were first collaborating together, we were struggling a little bit with working in a strange studio. John's left-handed, I'm right-handed. And we decided rather than trying to make highly controlled pieces that we would go for soft forms and really play with the fluidity of the glass, and so our first pieces were like bags or like a handkerchief or even like a sheree, which is a silk brocade bag that they use for the um, Japanese tea ceremony. They store some of the tea service in it. And um, it was just playing with those really soft forms. And when the glass is hot, it's, it's really fluid and, and it can do all these things that fabric can, but you can freeze it as it cools and keep those qualities in the in the mm -hmm. final piece so in the beginning it was just like a single bag and it might have even been opaque and we had a dinner party one night we were sitting around talking with all the people and they were all artists and we started this conversation about if you make a container someone puts something in it mm -hmm. what if it's not what you want in the container and after that dinner party john and i said what if we put something in the container what if we put bags inside of our bags and we made them transparent? And so it was just one of those things that we did it. And then as we started doing it and you had like not one inside, but two, they started having sort of um, human qualities. Yeah, personalities. They're really sort of like playful and, you know, whimsical. And so that's really where the bag started. And as we started doing the pieces that were started making us think about like how people might lean into somebody or someone might climb on someone, then it took us to the eventually to wanting to make something and we could have a much more direct um, 
expression of the human form. And that's when we went to the life casting and started doing hands and faces. Yep. Yeah. I think you can definitely tell looking at these, the squishy leaning bodily aspect of them. And I even think, you know, of kind of a family or an embryo of sorts, yes. like the mother bag and there's the little baby bags inside. So the relationships that you can get out of uh, a non-human object, I think is very, very interesting, which then of course, like you said, translated into your later works, but your current body of work is very, very impressive and very different from those squishy original forms <laughs> that we started talking about. So talk a little bit about how you went from that and this middle journey of realis realism and then how you kind of ended up in, in the realm that you're, you are at now. Well, as we started moving into um, cast, direct casting human forms, we started thinking about the energy that's between two people, our collaboration. And we actually did a cast, um, solid cast glass block with two hands in it. And in between the hands was a sphere with some layers and, and what we considered the possibilities of energy in, in between. It was a... Um, not a really big block, maybe this size, but in between the two hands was the sphere. And that opened up a bunch of possibilities for us. Ideas. We, the idea of that sphere holding energy, possibility, a seed, an embryo, all sorts of. A small universe. And so that's like when you look at the piece the museum has, it's the cut form. Mm -hmm. It's very much that energy that those hands are holding there. And that same thing is what translated when we started doing some of these bigger pieces is we were like thinking, how do you think about different energies or forms or like even like the energies, the stars scattered across the sky and how are those connected? And so this piece for Muskegon was really about, we looked at the, the landscape, the sky, the water and wanted to bring in the elements of that environment Nature. there. Yeah. But it's right on Lake Michigan, which so is it's, it's such a gorgeous, gorgeous setting. And then also kind of playing with that whole idea of um, who are those people and the different energies that come together to make a community. And so each one of those spirits or rings we think about is holding the energy of different groups in, within that community. And that the steel structure is what pulls it all together and holds that there. Yeah, and I just want to point out too, I put the dimensions down there and I, I didn't do that on any, any other piece because this thing is just massive. And, and I watched a video of you all build it and it's, <laughs> it's, it's really impressive. So if anyone watching is up in that area, I would recommend going to check it out because it, it's a really stunning work that changes too as you move around it. This isn't a traffic circle, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. So you can so literally drive around it. Yeah. The lights so when you in go it, around it, it changes. The lights in it are dust to dawn lights. So it has not a really strong lighting, but more like you'd see a constellation in the sky as a soft glow. A glow. And what, what's also in this one here, I don't know, they probably can see if they look closely. We have patterning in the glass, very much like the trails of an energy or like um, stars going across the sky is the pattern in the background. And one of the things that was really exciting for us when we installed it was being able to see how the glass played with the sky and it would like frame the sun or the moon or a star. Yeah, here you can definitely see the moon right through there uh, yeah. and, and those etching lines too. Kate, you were talking about before we started recording how kind of these etching lines have a tie to vitrography. So we're going to be shifting in that direction in just a minute, but would you like to expand on that? Yeah, so we're doing some pieces right now that are much smaller than this, but are round spheres. And we had been looking at some of the glass plates that the vitrographs were made from and in some of those plates, a tool is used to etch or engrave in a sense, a line or a pattern or to draw on the surface so that there's something that can pick up the ink. And in inking those up and looking at them, we were thinking, wow, what would happen if we engraved a pattern on the outside of one of our spheres and then wiped in um, 
a color so that you would have that patterning sitting in there. And so we've just been playing with that today um, on one of our pieces and hopefully tomorrow we'll finish up that <laughs> pattern on the surface. And it's pretty exciting. And I think it's one of the things as artists that you do one thing and you're not necessarily at that moment thinking about something else or how it will connect in your life, but the vitreous graphs have come back full circle and are now influencing our work, which I think is pretty exciting. It is for sure. So talking about vitreography, we're going to move on along to sort of the main topic of tonight's discussion. Uh, and this is in conjunction with our current exhibition of Harvey Littleton's prints at the Fort A Museum of Art. So on your left here, you have a photo of Harvey Littleton and uh, he is working with another artist that uh, he invited to his studio to make prints. So John and Kate, I'm just going to first pose the question in case viewers don't know or they haven't seen the exhibition yet. What is vitriography and why is it so special or different in the printmaking realm? So vitriography is using a glass plate to transfer an image onto paper usually. <laughs> and, um, so all of the vitreographs from dad's studio had at least one glass plate. He was open to combining with um, using digital process or other forms of printmaking. Same. He didn't want to uh, ignore the past of printmaking, but all of, the, all of the additions that were run had at least one glass plate. And the printing from a glass plate is really different than some of the other processes, like with lithography, you might be using a stone or a zinc plate, or an etching might be using a copper plate. And it, one of the things that I find really fabulous about it is you can see through the plate, it's transparent. So if you were doing a print that maybe had three or four colors, you could do your drawing or your background or whatever on your first plate and then lay a second plate over the top of it and draw and you could see what you have underneath there. The other thing that was really fabulous about the printing from the glass plates is a lot of the plates that are metal will interact with some of your colors. So some of your yellows. Especially the yellows. Yeah. Are just, they, the color isn't, doesn't stay as true. In the glass plates that doesn't get affected at all, but the ink, the ink is not affected by the glass plate because the glass plate is neutral. Right. The other thing is, is if you run a, a print edition, your first print should be as crisp and clean as your 50th print is. Or your 100th print. I mean, Harvey's editions were pretty small. They were rarely, I don't think any of them were more than 50. And I, uh, there might be some 75s. 75s, yeah. but they, they were, were pretty small. They editions. were small editions. Many of them were like 20. But a metal plate with as much pressure as they used would change over the, this, the edition. And your first print would be much different than your last print. With the glass plate, as long as the printer didn't drop it or something, the last impression of that plate would be the same as the first. But, Glasses a perfect material under that compressive force that a, a, a printing press puts on the glass. So it doesn't lose any detail. Right, it's something we look for as a museum when, when we're acquiring prints into the collection are you kind of want the lowest number possible because of that crispness that you get with the first few plate pulls. So. Um, yeah, that's a very important point to vitriography that's different from normal yeah. printmaking. It's something that some people don't realize. So if you look at Harvey's really early editions that were run in the studio, they just say edition of 50 or edition of 25. He did not want to number them, but all of his friends who were printers gave him so much grief about it that he was like, all right, if you want me to. So after that, I don't know, I can't remember what year it was, but at some point, they started numbering. They started numbering the editions. One, but they're all pretty also, much identical. So yeah, I see where you're yeah. saying. Well, the, yeah. any printer is going to have a little variation, so mm -hmm. they do have some variance between some them. character in them. Prints. Yeah, and it helps us keep track of them. Definitely. So, yeah. um, just if there's 25 prints and you don't know what number it is, you can't sure. yeah. say. <laughs> This is, yep. this is the one. <laughs> it could be one of 25. 
So how did he find vitriography? I know he developed it, but vitriography has been around for quite a while. I think that the first time that anyone discovered it was in Austria in the 1850s. So how does something almost 200 years old kind of make its way back to a studio to get um, worked on again? So the first prints in the 1850s to get the glass to be able to run it through the press without breaking, they had to grind and polish both sides. By hand. By hand. And they used hydrofluoric acid to put the, the, um, imagery. the imagery into the plate. And that hydrofluoric acid is a dangerous acid Head because yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a, something that you casually work with. So I think it was abandoned relatively quickly just because of the cost of the plates. Mm -hmm. That was something that attracted to dad to the glass plates a really good litho stone. Um, it's really thick, it's heavy. And, and it was, it's expensive. And they're expensive. And a piece of glass that came out of a float glass factory is not that expensive. It's a common material. It was accessible. Accessible. But that's actually not how he got to it. So that story of how he came to it, I always thought was really fun. So Harvey had an NEA grant to do a cold working workshop in his studio, as in for his graduate students. And when I say cold and, working- And other teachers as yeah. well. So when I say cold working, I mean like how you would like grind and polish the surface or how you might put a pattern into a piece of glass. So we're not talking prints at all. He's talking three-dimensional objects, small sculptures, vessels, vases. Working with any kind of uh, way to put an image onto the glass or, or change the glass in its cold state. So he brought in what um, people from Corning? Max Erlocker and uh, another man. Now I'm blanking what his name is. But anyway, he brought in some really highly skilled engravers and they came to do this workshop and they played with all sorts of stuff. And they worked with some flat glass and put different kinds of resist on it took it to a monument works where they would be sandblasting somebody's name onto a marble slab or something. And they sandblasted these plates. And dad looked at the plates and said, these look like they could be printing plates. And he had a, a good friend at the university. We said, can you, help, can you help print these? Let's try printing. So his first printing from the glass plates was just because he saw something that was made for a demonstration for his class and said, wow, this looks like something else. And when he ran the, I think the first plate they ran through broke and then Harvey realized there was stuff on the back of it that it had. I think they clean. had some tape on it or something. Mm. On the, the press bed has to be Very clean wow. and the, the glass plate has to be clean. And then it's, it's not a problem. And the second one that they ran went through fine. And he was really excited by it, but he's also teaching full time. So he ran what, maybe two, three, four prints before he moved to North Carolina. And I just graduated from high school. I'd had printmaking and he bought, a, I think it was this press, a little press. That you see in the picture. Yeah. And uh, I printed for a summer for him. Yeah. So the man, in on on the right side of that image is Norm Schulman, and he was a ceramics teacher um, in Toledo. And Dad had been trying to get these workshops going for glass. Norm was there teaching ceramics, and the director of the museum, Toledo Art Museum, said, "Norm, help Harvey do this. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> Make it happen." And that was the first glass workshop in 1962. And then dad moved to where Norm had moved near Penland School in North Carolina. And Norm is back in the studio helping dad print. Here. Yeah, yep. That is very cool. It's all kind of interwoven and in, like the, the process of discovery, these kind of happy accidents are kind of also the story of the studio glass movement in a lot of ways too. It's just yeah. artists trying stuff out and they don't yeah. know if it's going to work or not work but that's kind of that's the main excitement and fun 
of why so many people I think were drawn to it and got interested in yep. it is because it was really a new frontier that no one had worked with before. Yep. So that is very cool and exciting. I have here on the next slide, um, some early, an early image that Harvey made, one of the first trials um, that he tried to print with vitrography. And then on the right is kind of a later, a later edition of that. So would you mind talking a little bit about the beginning process, you know, how this print was made? And then I noticed later on his, his work got very, very crisp and clean and geometric. Uh, we have a few other pieces by Harvey Littleton in, in the exhibition and also in our print collection now, which are very similar to this. And I think the same thing can be said with his glass later on too. these very bold colors, kind of with a very clear or white blank casing around them. So would you mind going into these two pieces for us? So the piece on the left is um, one of the first trials that they took to the monument works. I think it was hot glue, it could have been Elmer's glue. <laughs> and uh, they let it set up and took it to the Monument Works and it has a very deep sandblast on. So the areas of white that are near the center are deeper than the paper would, would uh, bend. And the areas around the outside are um, three colors of ink. He wanted to try adding more and more pressure as you went. So the first um, would have been a blue, the second would have been a red, and the last was a yellow. So you'd add more pressure as you went. Yeah, you can kind of see that they don't always completely overlap with one another. We have another curator at the museum who says she hates looking at this piece because it's kind of a 3D effect. If you yes. get close, it kind of messes with your eyes a little bit. And yep. so I think it's fun. I really love it, but it's so funny because when she was matting and framing all the pieces for the show, she said that one about drove me crazy. <laughs> it's just kind of really out there in your face when you see it in person. So the piece on the right, origami, was actually a series, I think, of four prints that he did. And with those, if you take a single color, say the um, blue, that is a single plate that's the shape of that blue form that was inked up and run through the press. The red is a single red plate and the yellow is a single yellow a plate that's inked with yellow and run through the press. And the overlap is what gives you those, the overlap of the ink is what gives you that sort of a little bit of a green or a little bit more of an orange or a purplish kind of quality. And what I love about these is it's very much like the overlapping colors Harvey was using in the overlay pieces that he was mm -hmm. making at that in same glass. time in yes. glass. And so it's very much playing with the transparency of color and how it plays with light. Um, and so I, I, I think that they're just a really wonderful example of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I love the overlap between the two. And he was kind of making these things at the same time as well. So it's fun yep. to see how one thing translates in glass versus in yeah. print form. Yeah. They're kind of the same concept, but just visually very different. And then this is um, the master printmaker, Judith. Would you guys like to speak a little bit about how she came to the studio? And then also maybe a little more, bit more about the, the printing process and how she would work with different artists to kind of take their ideas and put them into, into action in a printing way. So dad invited all sorts of different artists to the studio, um, ceramics people, glass people, printmakers, painters. And he wanted to build up a, a vocabulary, a, a tool chest of different techniques to use with the glass plate printing. Um, this is a standard um, printmaker's press, a French tool press. And he just would start adding different layers of uh, different techniques to be able to use. Those um, prints in the background are some of dad's as well. Mm -hmm. And Judy right. came to the studio, I think about 1988. And, um, 
I think Harvey had put out just a call for people to apply. And I don't know if he put it out one of the print cattle, you know, one of the, the, one of the print conferences or a magazine. I'm not sure exactly how at that point, but his, his printers came from all sorts of different places. A lot of times it's sort of that thread where one person comes and they're about ready to leave and they tell the next person that, mm -hmm. oh, you should give Harvey Littleton a call. Mm -hmm. And that was also true for a lot of the printers who came to the studio. One of the print printers who printed for Harvey for maybe a year or two had a Cranbrook tie. Harvey also was a graduate of Cranbrook. And he invited a lot of people that he knew from Cranbrook. And so they, you know, so there's a whole slew of people who printed at Harvey studio that have a Cranbrook connection, or maybe the connection was they, somebody um, was known because um, the curator at the Mint Museum in North Carolina uh, in Charlotte got an NEA grant to have um, painters come to print at the studio and her invitations brought in a group of people and those group of people would recommend somebody else or Harvey would bring in somebody. So it was sort of like this net that got thrown out and it just kept getting wider and wider as time went on as far as who was invited and how they were connected. Mm -hmm. Dad had a good friend in Germany that came and printed quite a bit. He's, his family had a glass factory and he also was a painter so he came and printed and, and dad would go and work in Erwin's glass factory in Germany. And he also taught, they had a little um, build work, which still exists. It's a small school in Fraunau. And he taught printing from glass plates there a number of summers, as mm -hmm. well as did some of Harvey's um, printers. Um, yes. Yeah. For those listening who might know a thing or two about Studio Glass, this is Erwin Eich who is kind of the co-founder along with Harvey of the uh, Studio Glass movement. So uh, I think Harvey, like you said, got to know all these people and made just so many friends and yep. artists, I think if they're like-minded like him, like to try all these different new things. I think that I read somewhere over a hundred artists worked yes. in his studio and printed, which is yep. really amazing. And did they stay there like on the property too? Dad had a guest cottage so that, um, it, Spruce Pine, where the studio is, is fairly remote. It's on the Blue Ridge Parkway and um, beautiful views, but... Uh, so back when Harvey had the studio going, there was not a lot. Like on, by eight o'clock, there was no place to go out to eat. At no. that point, it was a dry county. We had no alcohol even. So the, the guest house was really kind of necessary. There aren't like a bunch of hotels here you could stay at. And I think Harvey also wanted it to feel... Um, I want, he wanted the people to feel more connected and you could literally walk across the road and you were at the studio. So the studio was available 24 hours a day. You could just you know, work at your leisure. Mm -hmm. Most people came for a week or two and many of the, the artists that came would come back again. Yep. Kind of like so a treat. It sounds, yeah. it sounds really nice. And how yeah. often did they norm or how, how much time did they usually stay? So a week to two weeks, depending on what they were working on. Um, and oftentimes when they would come, um, so Judy would be there from like nine to five or eight to four, or whatever, the, you know, about eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. And so she would work with them. So they would work on something. She would proof it. There would be a conversation about, is this what you're wanting? You know, or visually. Here's another technique you might try. This might get you something different. And what was really wonderful is over that, time period, well, even before Judy was there, but also when Judy was there, everybody brought their own ideas and it was a studio where people shared. So each person got to build on what the last artists had learned right. when they were there. And um, Harvey kept all the glass plates. He made the arrangement with the artists that when they printed there, that they would leave the plates there as a teaching tool for the other artists that would come in the future. So if you had been wanting to try a particular technique, Judy could pull out a plate and a print and say, this is what, you know, Herb Jackson did, or this is what Dan Claire Walden, Dan Bleed, or, this yeah. is how Erwin Eich approached it. You know, and people could see things from very, you know, very abstract to really tight, realistic. I mean, you think about the concepts or the content behind the work 
and it was the whole gamut. And then you also could think about any process. So they found someone who could do uh, waterless lithography and that works perfectly with glass. You grind the glass plate, get a really even uh, textured finish on it. Mm -hmm. And you can draw on the glass plate with a water soluble marker. <clears throat> Then it's treated with a uh, solution of um, diluted silicone. Yeah, like a silicone glue kind of thing. And then you wash out the place where the, the marker was. And the difference between the texture of the, the glass plate and the silicone, you can roll ink onto that. And it's very much like a lithograph, mm -hmm. but it's called um, silligraphy or waterless waterless lithography yeah. and um, it was a, another great technique to be able to be used for, by the artists there mm -hmm. yeah. and so it's like one of the printer master printers realized that if you didn't want the sharp edge of the glass plates to cut into the paper so much <laughs> that he would um, take a, um, a masonite square cut out the shape of the plate that you're going to be printing and drop it in and it have that masonite at the same level as the plate. And then you didn't get so much of a um, embossment around the edge. Or it also made it easy to um, register. register that if you had four different glass plates to get four different colors or whatever effects you were working yeah. with, you could get the registration yeah. pretty really right on with that yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And this is just another, I'm going to change the slide real quick. This is just another example of kind of one of those process transfers. So we have um, the artist James Tanner here, and he is, I think, more of a drawer 2D um, uh, painter by trade, um, but he is having to translate his skills and um, kind of aesthetic into a print medium. Mm -hmm. um, and I love this piece. It's very, very fun. Yeah. <laughs> so Jim actually was a, uh, was a university professor in ceramics in Minnesota mm -hmm. for a number of years. Oh, yes. And he it, made the masks. Yes. I right. remember researching yes. about him. Yeah. And he also was one of Harvey's early glass students, ceramics and glass students. So that's the connection with James and Harvey was um, glass. And uh, he and his wife, Janice, um, would come down for, they were down there more than once, I think. And I can't remember which times they printed and which times they were just coming through to visit. Um, but it's always was fun to stop in the studio and see what he was working on. His work is very lively um, and energetic. Um, and just, I really love the color palettes that he works with. And I don't know, Jim and Janice are just great people. <laughs> So I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute so we can be big again, um, because I think the last few questions that I have don't necessarily require images. So we've talked a lot about Littleton Studios. So many people went through there. Um, wonderful prints and techniques and experimentation being done. Um, but I know that Littleton Studios closed in 2009. So I just wanted to ask you all, as I know that you kind of manage the Littleton collection, what is being done with the prints now that the studio itself is closed? And what do you see for the future of vitreography? Well, it's being taught in several places. There's a continuation at Pulchuk School. Uh, there's a printer in Florida that's associated with the university that's getting a collection of the vitreographs. From... And he, he's, he's also been teaching his students mm -hmm. there. So we are trying to place prints in museums. Um, we're selling a few through galleries and, and our studio. Um, and just showing them. And it's also just every time we get a chance, it's going out and telling people about the printing process and what the advantages of it are. Um, it's sharing, you know, things like some of the, the pieces that Harvey wrote about vitriography and some of the other people have. Um, so it's telling both the history of it and the possible future for it. Pilchuck School has done some really exciting things. I think they've done 
Um, they did a, a show at the Chrysler Museum not too long ago. Well, maybe not, maybe five years ago now. They're considering writing a book about it. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that way. And so we just keep promoting it because we think it's a wonderful um, matrix for doing prints from and that it's just got a, a lot of possibilities to still explore. And um, so we just, we keep promoting it and hoping that more people will become interested in it as a, both as something beautiful to look at, but also as a process for making prints. Yeah, it's something as a, an art history major and also knowing a lot of artists I never encountered before. And I know we have a glass plate now um, that you all loan to us, a uh, Hall Ziegler copy on a plate. And we have it on display in our print and drawing study center now. And we have classes come in all the time and see the prints, talk about different techniques and things like that. And we had a printmaking group come in just a few weeks ago and they were so excited when they saw the plate and just yeah. like the ease of producing it because one of them said, well, I have a Dremel, I could do that. I could get some right. heat glass and, you know, try yeah. this out. And it's just, I think a technique a lot of people don't know about. And um, the connection to Studio Glass is really interesting, which is kind of how our museum got drawn to it in the first place. Mm -hmm. But also the prints themselves in of themselves are really, really special. And I mean, Harvey, after he kind of retired from the grass, glass world, dedicated himself to this printmaking technique. So obviously he thought that it had some merit and just kind of like the Studio Glass getting off the ground. He wanted to do that with photography as well. So. We're very, very excited that you all donated prints to our museum and we're very, very proud to have them on display right now. I just wanna go back to the PowerPoint real quick because we have some photos of our new exhibition up that uh, we would like people to check out. So this is Graphs Collaborative Prints from Littleton Studios. We have almost every print that um, John and Kate donated to us from Littleton Studios on display. Um, and it'll be on display until January 29th. So you have until then to see it a little bit over a month. It's in the first gallery, right whenever you walk in. Uh, this wall right here kind of shows a few more of Harvey Littleton's prints and um, you can kind of see the different techniques and all the friends that he worked with. So with that, uh, I wanted to ask if we have any questions from our viewers. Feel free to put it in the chat box on YouTube. And if not, we will wrap up here, but we'll just give it a few seconds to see. So I hope that when people go to the museum that you check out, there's two prints by Harvey. They were in the middle of that last frame that you showed. And those prints were actually created by shooting a piece of plate glass with a gun. And I'm not necessarily recommending that to anybody no. out there. Printmakers. Printmakers. Try at your but, own risk. <laughs> but the he, the he got some bank glass and he got some um, laminated glass. And I think these were the laminated glass. Yeah. But the result was just so cool when he inked it up. And it's funny because he talks about, he talked about, decades ago, and I never really had made the connection until, I don't know, more recently, maybe even after he died, he had talked about when he worked in the assembly line for a short period of time, and it was an inspector and in corning for like teapots and stuff that were made. He was the person who got to like reject stuff if it was a second, if there was something wrong with it. And what you did is you threw it in a pile and broke it. And one of the things Harvey loved the way glass looked when it was broken. And I thought, oh my gosh, here it is in these plates. He's once again <laughs> playing with the glass. I love those. Those are, at the bottom one is my very favorite print in the entire collection. I, I yep. absolutely adore it and I love it. They're, they're really, really stunning. And yeah, all of the wonderful, just just even some of them are, are raised, kind of embossed looking. And there's yep. just so many different textures that you can get to. I think with this, that is very unusual for, for prints. I think yep. they're a lot more, I don't know, em emotive than other prints. It's kind of hard to describe, but because they're just so vibrant and there's all these different techniques being used, there's there's a lot to see and a lot of differences with them all together. So let's double check one more time. It looks like we don't have any questions. So John and Kate, 
thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, we're so grateful to have both your work and Harvey's work. And we look forward to talking with you more in the future. Yeah. Well, good night. We enjoyed yeah, it. And thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm Jenna Gilley. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but I'm Associate Curator of Art at the Fort Museum of Art. Um, please check out our new glass wing. It is all currently on display in three uh, of our galleries. We have a permanent collection of glass now. Um, you guys are welcome anytime as well, John K, to check it out. And then we also have our vitriography show going up. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great night.